Dr. Larissa DeSantis, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from your home in Nashville, Tennessee. You are a conservation biologist at Vanderbilt University and vertebrate paleontologist in the Department of Biological Sciences, and you study fossil mammals as a way of determining how they responded to ancient climate change. We heard you on the Wildlife Podcast just recently talking about the Australian quokka, a very cute and Instagrammable kind of wallaby. Now, that must have been a, a fun episode for you to do. Yes, it was. Um, and it actually brings a lot of attention to the importance of fossils for studying conservation. And so um, in the case of the quokka, what we actually did is we looked at at quokkas that are alive today uh, on the mainland of Australia and also on two different islands that they occupy, Bald Island and Rottnest Island. And we also looked at quokkas from the Pleistocene from about 27,000 years ago um, when they lived on the mainland. And so by comparing what the quokkas were doing you know, 27,000 years ago to what they're doing today, we actually see that their ecology is quite different. So what we see today is that they tend to occupy fairly dense environments and their stable isotopes indicate that they were eating foods from the densest part of the forest. So they were um, eating sort of uh, leaves or things from dense shrubs or, or dense forests. And today that likely happens because we have foxes in these areas. So Europeans brought over foxes, which are invasive species. They have wreaked havoc on these ecosystems and quokkas are really having to, um, uh, you know, have a real challenge now surviving in the midst of um, these foxes, whereas they tend to do fairly well in the islands where the foxes never made it to. Now, by sort of comparing what the quokkas were doing in the past to today, we actually get a better sense of their ecology. And so we know that, in fact, they're able to occupy more mosaic habitats, more open habitats. And that snapshot of what we're seeing of quokkas on the mainland is really just, you know, a, a, a function of all of the sort of many interactions that we've also had and uh, many influences we've had on the quokka. So bringing the foxes over, habitat fragmentation, etc. And so it, it's important that we know the full scope of their mm. ecology, the full scope of that sort of niche or what they do so that we can actually properly manage for these animals moving forward. So yes, it was a lot of fun and, and okay. quokkas are also like one of the cutest animals. And so I encourage you all to to Google quokka and in particular a quokka selfie. There's all sorts of fun photos of folks. Well, today we're going to be talking about one of the most famous groups of all extinct mammals, the saber-toothed cats, and try to get a picture of what it might be like if we were to travel back in time and watch these magnificent animals in action. But before we leap into that world, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Larissa, you're known as a paleontologist, but originally that field was uh, the furthest from your mind. Isn't that right? It was. Um, so initially I sort of set off to college thinking I was going to be a political science major and go to law school and maybe even someday be a politician. Um, and, you know, I just happened upon a paleobiology class and was fascinated. I loved all of the evolutionary theory, much like I loved political theory, and it just really captured my attention. And after just even a few lectures, I I was volunteering, uh, preparing dinosaur fossils at the University of Chicago and really couldn't shake the, the paleo bug, we call it. Um, and so long story short, I ended up um, going or finishing my degree, transferring to the University of California, Berkeley, where when I transferred, I actually transferred into the College of Natural Resources. And so that allowed me to take a lot more paleo courses, more science-based courses, but I was also doing a lot of work in sort of the field of resource management. So I sort of had two passions, one which was mm -hmm. sort of conserving modern species uh, and the other which was learning about the past. And at that time, these were very different things. Um, and so, you know, I really had to kind of make a choice. Am I going to do what I considered sort of the um, 
the more noble pursuit, which is trying to work on on saving, you know, modern species, or was I going to do what I considered at the time uh, sort of a, a a selfish passion of the fossil record? And long story short, I went off and I pursued a, a master's in environmental management, and I really loved it, but I I missed paleontology. And I, you know, also did some education work. I drove a 38-foot Winnebago with dinosaur exhibits inside for the American mm -hmm. Museum of Natural History, um, which was a lot of fun. And brought, you know, paleontology to school kids throughout New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut. And I really loved it. But I, I wanted really to do all of those things. I wanted to do the education. I wanted to do the research. And I wanted to integrate these two fields of conservation and paleontology. And so fortunate for, for me, I was able to do that, um, doing a PhD at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And there I was able to sort of look at how animals have responded to climate change over millions to thousands of years um, and begin to understand, you know, extract lessons learned from the fossil record that were of relevance to conservation today. And fortunately for me, these fields have really come together uh, in the last few decades, especially, um, where we now have a field called conservation paleobiology, where we actually ask questions that are of direct relevance to conservationists, but we use the fossil record to help answer those questions. And so that's what I really like to think of myself as, is sort of, you know, studying the past, but to better understand sort of lessons learned and ways in which we can, you know, help conserve our future. Okay, let's talk all things saber-tooth. The most well-known of these animals is the Smilodon, a species which lived in the Americas during the Pleistocene. So before we get into the other feliforms that boasted saber-like canines, let's just concentrate on this particular animal. Larissa, Smilodon was, I believe, the first of this type of creature to be found. So can you give us your best overview of this animal based on what we know so far. Yeah, so Smilodon populator was first discovered in Brazil in the mid 1800s. And many uh, sort of decades later, then you had um, uh, Joseph Leidy, who actually described a different animal called Felis fatalis. Now, many years later, Edward Drinker Cope actually combined the two names. So uh, the fatalis, the species component of um, Felis fatalis, but actually identified it as the same genus as Smilodon. So mm -hmm. that became Smilodon fatalis. And this is uh, one of the most iconic saber-toothed cats. And in part, the reason why it's so iconic is because we have so many fossils of it at the La Brea Tar Pits in Southern California. And so we're really able to study it in quite a bit of detail. But then there was also another saber-toothed cat called Smilodon gracilis. And as the name implies, it was the more gracile saber-toothed cat. It was smaller uh, and it was also older than both Smilodon populator and, and Smilodon fatalis. Well, we don't see any saber-toothed cats today. In fact, the ancient cats that you study aren't all that closely related to modern big cats at all. They are part of an ancient lineage called the Machaerodonts, and this subfamily is split into quite a few interesting groups. Isn't that right? So yes, absolutely. So saber-toothed cats are part of the family Felidae. So they are true cats. Um, they are a bit outside of what we call crown group cats or modern day cats. And so these are things that include, you know, leopards and lions and tigers and um, et cetera, cheetahs. And, and so the Macarodonte is the a subfamily. And what we know about it is that there are um, a handful of saber-toothed cats that are closely related to one another. So for example, we have things like um, homotherium, which are closely related to um, Smilodon, right? They're sort of a, 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 an out group and they're also related to things like Xenosmilus. Um, and then we've got the different Smilodon taxa, uh, Gracilis, Populator, and Fatalis that are all closely related to one another. But all of these sort of saber-toothed cats do form a particular group in which they all share um, the fact that they have these elongated sabers. 
So one other thing that's really important is a lot of people will call the saber-toothed cat a saber-toothed tiger. And so the yeah. reason we've moved away from that terminology is because a saber-toothed cat, smile it on for example, isn't any more closely related to a tiger than it is to a lion, than it is to a cheetah necessarily. So it's, it's sort of outside that crown group of cats. Um, and so we know it's a cat. We can say it's a cat but it may not have been tiger-like in, in any regard. And so that's why we've kind of moved away from, you know, saber-toothed tiger and really mm. moved towards saying saber-toothed cat. That's right. It's like the Tasmanian tiger is more of a wolf, really. It's a marsupial, isn't it? But people just like the word tiger, I think. There's something cool about it. They do. And I will say even the thylacine is, you know, more closely related to a kangaroo and we're most more closely related to tigers than, you know, they are to, to you know, yeah. than we are to them and they are to tigers, for example. But it's, you know, kind of a, a way of describing them in part because of, of, in the case of the thylacine, of the stripes on, on them that we do know existed. So the other thing that's really interesting is that there are saber tooth cats that aren't actually cats, they're cat-like animals. And these are within the group Feliforms. And these are things like Nimravid. So they are carnivores, but they are not cats. And another really interesting fact is actually hyenas are Feliforms as well. They're more closely yeah. related to cats than they are to dogs. Even though in some sense, people often attribute to them as looking dog-like, they are in fact more cat-like and are Feliforms. Well, people are just so fascinated by those sabers so let's see what we can find out about them now didn't they get in the way at all when they were eating uh do both males and females have them were they i don't know just for sexual display and why don't we see saber teeth in, in species today so that's a fantastic question and we do see saber teeth evolving many times in the fossil record and so we see you know groups like the nimravids display elongated teeth. We see many of, you know, these the saber-toothed cats display these elongated teeth. And then we have other things that are actually modern cats, which are, have what people often describe as semi-saber-toothed teeth. So the clouded leopard, for example, has mm. fairly elongated canines compared to the rest of its uh, teeth and the proportions to its skull. Um, what's really interesting about sort of sabers is they allow you to um, essentially inflict a, a kill bite or a bite that can cause the prey to bleed out quickly. And, you know, often when we think of these sort of ferocious cats or these saber-toothed cats in particular, we think that they can just take on anything, right? They can take on any, any type of prey animal and they'll be just fine. But we underestimate the actual amount of damage that prey can actually cause and inflict on predators. And we see this all the time. We see this in broken teeth. We see this in um, broken jaws, uh, in modern day cats especially. And so there's different strategies. There's a strategy of sort of um, biting on and holding on and, and restraining mm -hmm. the prey for a long period of time with the, both the forelimbs and also the teeth. Uh, and then there's other strategies such as the saber toothed cats in which you're likely to cause that animal to actually die much quicker if it bleeds out quicker, right? And so you're less likely to incur damage to yourself if the animal dies more quickly. And so you could quickly see how, you know, you could see selection for these types of traits occurring. If you have slightly elongated sabers, you're able to sort of inflict that kill bite easier, um, you're bigger, uh, then, then that might be something that is, um, that helps and aids in your survival. And so very quickly we can see how, how having sabers can be a real advantage to, to lots of cats. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw saber tooth teeth come around again, you know, whether it's in the clouded leopard or uh, in other cats in the mm. future. And did males and females both have them? Yes. Yeah, so um, all of the saber tooth cats that we've looked at, both the males and females have them. So it doesn't look like it's some sort of uh, trait that is sexually dimorphic in any regard. Um, and in fact, uh, having sabers is really important. So a really cool fact about saber tooth teeth is um, for any of the kids or, or adults who have children and they know that when you lose your teeth, you're sort of left with, you know, many teeth often gone for an extended period of time. And so that creates a problem, right? If you, if you give a young child an apple and you ask them mm. to eat the apple and they're missing all of their incisors, they're going to have a really difficult time biting into it. They're going to have to cut it up manually, eat it in the back of their teeth. They're not going to be able to sort of crunch into it. And so that can be a real disadvantage if you're missing teeth for a while. 
What's really cool about saber tooth cats and also other cats as well is um, they actually have this little groove that's on the inside of the tooth of their saber tooth of their juvenile saber tooth, their baby tooth essentially. So they mm -hmm. have their little baby sabers and this groove that actually allows that adult saber to sort of grow right along inside of it. And so the adult saber will erupt and it's not until that adult saber is fairly erupted, right? It's there for, you know, it's a pretty um, established mm -hmm. tooth that they will actually lose their baby saber. So they're not without their baby saber for six months or a year or anything like that. They actually maintain them until that adult saber comes in and then they will lose that baby saber. And so that suggests that these teeth in particular are really important to being able to hunt prey uh, to their, their survival, essentially. One of the macarodonts that you've researched recently is the species Homotherium. So uh, what can you tell us about this animal and what exactly has your research uncovered? Yeah, so Homotherium is a extremely sort of cosmopolitan cat. It's been found in Eurasia, Africa, and throughout the Americas. And so it's really this amazing saber-toothed cat. It's not quite, um, doesn't have as elongated sabers as Smilodon, for example, um, but it was, you know, sort of found everywhere except for Antarctica and Australia. And so what we have done is we've sort of taken a new look at this, this cat. So we've looked at the morphology a bit um, with uh, co-author Mauricio Anton, but then we have reconstructed its ecology by using stable isotopes and dental microware. And that can give us some insight as to the type of prey it was actually eating um, and how it was hunting and sort of what parts of the prey it was eating as well. So there's a lot of information we can get from that. So a few things. So morphology gives us a sort of first approximation of what an animal does, right? And that's because uh, various traits have been selected for through time, through evolution, and essentially, you know, if an animal has at the very basic level, you know, sharp pointy teeth, we think that they were eating meat, flat teeth, they were likely sort of grinding on vegetation, kind of going back to your sort of kindergarten level of, you know, <laughs> what is a carnivore, what is an herbivore? Yeah. Now, that all being said, there are other sort of morphological features that um, can vary, but also just like humans, you know, we, we actually can have a range of diets, right? So we are considered omnivores. Uh, but there are some individuals who don't eat meat. There are some individuals who eat lots of fish. There are some individuals who eat lots of meat and other folks who eat lots of vegetables. And this even goes back, you know, before sort of modern day society, you would have different cultures um, eat different proportions of food. And yet our morphology was essentially identical, right? And so a, the same thing can happen in, in things like saber tooth cats where, you know, you have their morphology and you can kind of infer different things. So we know that they were eating meat. We knew we know that they were predators, mm -hmm. but we can actually look at their limb proportions. And a few things that we know is that they were more gracile, had more elongated limbs um, and sort of a bit thinner uh, than the more robust saber tooth cat. And also their proportions suggest they, they weren't quite cheetah like and they weren't quite hyena-like. They were sort of in between, and they didn't have a long tail. So we don't think that they were these sort of open habitat, cheetah-like animals sort of, you know, racing and trying to capture prey and running in one direction and using that tail to kind of be able to move as they need to. But we do think that this com combination of factors suggested that they were more cursorial or moving across a landscape quickly um, and maybe for a prolonged period of time. So mm -hmm. the morphology suggests that they were eating sort of open habitat prey, but then we can follow that up with these other tests. So for example, we can use uh, stable isotopes. And stable isotopes are essentially, we, we drill the teeth, we make little tiny, uh, we use a dental drill and we take a little tiny uh, bit of enamel and then we will actually run that through a mass spectrometer. And what that gives us is it gives us sort of the chemical signature in the teeth. And essentially, you are what you eat. Everything you eat is incorporated into your tissues. And that can be your teeth, your bones, uh, your blood, your, your organs, your hair, your fingernails. But the great thing about teeth is that teeth are preserved and they're highly inorganic. And so at the time that they're actually laying down that enamel, they're mineralizing, mm. they're Th that mineral, that the, the carbonate component is actually reflecting the things that they're eating, the things that they're eating and the things that they're drinking. And so we can then 
analyze this and understand whether they were eating what we call um, C3 consuming prey or C4 consuming prey. But the, the other catch with this is this method, we need to be able to, we can only really use this method when we have that real dichotomy between C3 prey and C4 prey. And we only get that in sort of lower latitude locations over the past 7 million years, right? We have to have C4 grasses on the landscape and things eating C4 grasses. And those things are typically grazers like bison or horses or eventually when mammoths come in. Um, and then there's things that are eating more forested browse, right? So deer, tapers, maybe some different camels, um, uh, peccaries, and so though, and, and even mastodons, right? And so those are going to be more sort of C3 in their values. And so the fact that we can sort of tease these apart, we can tease these animals, which are eating these different plant sources apart, we can then apply it to homotherium and actually see which prey it was eating. Was it eating prey that was eating in a C3 environment, so forest, or was it eating prey that were eating C4 resources like warm season grasses in a more open ecosystem? And what we were able to show is that in fact it is eating um, sort of more open habitat prey, though it did eat some prey from other ecosystems as well. It preferred open habitat sort of grazers based on the proportion of the um, sort of, we, we do sort of these Bayesian mixing models where we can look at sort of probabilities of different prey mm -hmm. sources. And so they definitely had a preference for open habitat prey and ate more of them. But they also did eat some more closed habitat prey, things from the forest like peccaries and, and various camels and, and, and whatnot. And so, but putting this all together, this really suggests that they were these open habitat predator. And really in North America at this time in the, the late Pleistocene, there weren't too many open habitat predators. In fact, this is the first conclusive open habitat predator that we can say definitely was, um, though the American cheetah probably was as well based on its morphology alone, but we haven't done sort of the, the isotopic analyses or other types of studies to, to definitively say it was eating sort of C4 grazers. But based on the morphology, it probably was pretty cheetah-like in, in chasing things down in open environments. But homotherium is now this other cat that really has um, this open ha this preference for open habitat prey, and that's completely polar opposite from what we're seeing of saber-toothed cats from the Smilodon. And so you have two saber-toothed cats that are fairly closely related, coexisting in many of the same ecosystems, and they're doing entirely different things, right? So Smilodon is, is ambush hunting from the forest, largely eating forest-dwelling prey, uh, and then Homotherium is eating largely from these sort of open habitat environments. And while that may seem strange sort of initially, it actually makes a lot of sense. If you have two things that are fairly closely related to one another and fairly similar in form, having two different sort of ecologies or ecological mm -hmm. niches is really important to being able to coexist. The other thing that we're able to learn about Homotherium is that it was eating um, tough flesh. And when looking at sort of the evidence of what is found in this particular den where we actually studied uh, homotherium, we see lots of baby mammoths. And so this for a long time has suggested that maybe homotherium was actually eating lots of baby mammoths, but you actually have to test this. And so when we looked at it using isotopes, we actually found that the baby mammoths and homotherium had indistinguishable stable isotope values once you incorporated for that trophic shift. We also found that the microwear, um, which is looks at the microscopic wear patterns on teeth, suggested that homotherium was eating really tough foods, tougher than any modern cat today. And what we know about cats that eat tough foods is typically that means tough flesh. And in the case of baby mammoths or proboscideans in general, they have very tough flesh. And so the fact that you have homotherium found in association with numerous baby mammoths their isotopes are indistinguishable from one another, and their microwares suggest the consumption of tough flesh. All of these things taken together really do suggest that Homotherium was eating baby mammoths, although it did also eat other things like horses and bison and other ha open habitat grazers, for example. And I suppose bringing down a baby mammoth wasn't as much effort as a full-size mammoth, for instance. Yes, exactly. And so we do know that, for example, lions do not target elephants, but they will often target 
uh, elephant, juvenile elephants um, in some cases. And, you know, usually there's a whole slew of circumstances in which um, lions will actually, you know, consume juvenile elephants and that usually requires, you know, some sort of drought event or, you know, um, uh, a variety of situations because the elephants are very protective, right? They're very protective of yeah. their young. They've invested in these young. They've, uh, in many cases, carried them for, you know, a, a year and a half, essentially. Um, and they are going to defend those young. And so um, it's, it's very rare that lions will actually eat um uh, baby elephants, but it does happen. And so similarly, um, it could have occurred in sort of a, a low um, occurrence, you know, so it could, we, we really can't evaluate whether this was happening um, frequently or the accumulation of these baby mammoths was happening, you know, one every, you know, hundred years and you're just getting this accumulation over many thousands of years. Now, if we were able to get really good radiocarbon dates from these specimens, mm -hmm. then we could actually begin to, you know, evaluate that. But unfortunately, the preservation um, at this site, we aren't able to great, get great radiocarbon dates. And so it's very difficult to tease apart, you know, when all of these baby mammoths are accumulating. So it could have been common, it could have been rare, but it does look like they were in fact eating them and they were on the menu for these uh, saber-toothed cats. Well, people might not be aware of the extinct family of marsupial-like predators that also had large saber teeth. Now this can only be a product of convergent evolution, wouldn't you say? Yes, so we do see some level of convergence here, right? So convergence is when you have um, two groups of animals that don't share a common ancestor and yet exhibit very similar forms. So a really classic example of this is, uh, say, birds and bats um, exhibiting flight, right? They have wings, they can fly, and yet they can fly not because they share a common ancestor, but because these are traits that sort of evolved um, independently in different lineages in different groups. Um, so in the case of Thylacus mylis, there is sort of clear evidence of convergence, but uh, we often find that folks are really um, sort of looking, you know, there's a, a paper we wrote called an eye for a tooth, and we're so honed in to that elongated tooth that we just assume that everything that Thylacus mylis did was similar to, say, Smilodon or other saber-toothed cats. And when we actually take a really close look and this is through things like finite element analysis and also dental microware, we get begin to get sort of a different picture. And so those sabers may not have been used in the same way. Um, they may or may not have been used for exuding kill bites. They might have actually been used instead to sort of um, rip open carcasses and actually suck out the guts of prey. And some of these ideas are coming from the fact that they have a near lack of incisors and so they're able to kind of create that suction and um, eat very soft things. We also see when we look at their microscopic wear patterns that in fact they were eating very, very soft things. Yet they have um, sort of a, a, a pretty good amount of wear on their teeth, which might have been from um, various particulates and things. And so putting all of this together um, actually suggests that while they are broadly convergent and they definitely were sort of, you know, carnivorous animals, um, that they may have actually used these sabers in a different way. Uh, in, in getting different types of prey or accessing different parts of the carcass, for example. You're especially interested in how fossil mammals responded to ancient climate change. Larissa, we can't exactly time travel, but there are new ways of finding out lots of specific information about how the saber suits lived, what they ate, and even if they were social animals or not. And a lot of that has to do with isotopes and microware, correct? Yes, so often we can sort of revisit fossils and get an idea of what those animals were doing in life. So as I mentioned previously, morphology gives us that first approximation, but isotopes and microware actually give us information about what that animal was doing during its lifetime. And so similar to, you know, uh, using isotopes, we can use microware, which gets at the microscopic wear patterns on teeth. And in the case of carnivores, that can tell us something about how it utilizes carcasses. So before we can even study any fossil animals, we actually had to study modern animals. So we studied in collaboration with um, Blaine Schubert, uh, Peter Unger, and others. We studied uh, cheetahs, which we know actively avoid bone. 
lions, which we know do consume some bone, and hyenas, which actively consume bone. So we can observe these animals today, we know their behavior, and then the question was, can we actually see the microscopic wear patterns? Do they correspond with these different dietary behaviors in modern animals when we know what they're actually doing? And fortunately, the answer was yes. So the cheetahs actively avoid bone. We can see that in their microscopic wear patterns. Um, sort of the lions are sort of in between. And then the, the, the hyenas have really sort of complex, lots of pitting that occurs on their teeth. Mm. So we can then sort of go back into the fossil record and apply this to things like homotherium or, or smilodon to better understand what it was eating or the parts of the carcass it was eating. And so in the case of smilodon, for a long time it was thought that um, right before they went extinct that there were these tough times and that all the animals were sort of desperately consuming carcasses. And what we find is really no evidence for that. We actually see that they sort of consumed flesh and, and bone, um, much like uh, modern uh, lions do today, and sort of were potentially even sharing carcasses. Um, and so that gives us some information about how they consume the carcasses. And then we can actually apply it to other cats. So there was a, this cat called the American lion, and it had about a third of its its teeth were broken. So it was really thought that maybe this thing was scavenging. And in fact, when we look at the microscopic wear patterns, we found the total opposite, that it was in fact eating um, lots of flesh and not eating anything hard. And so putting this, these two things together, this suggests to us that this animal was breaking its teeth, potentially taking down prey, it was more of a solitary hunter um, or in competition with males for mating. Um, but then it was eating sort of the prime parts of the carcass, right? You would take down an animal and just sort of eat what you wanted from that carcass. You didn't have to scavenge, you weren't sharing carcasses. These, these things were more solitary, we believe, because um, we find them in a much lower abundance than we do saber tooth cats, for example. And so all of these different tools kind of putting together can tell us something about how these animals have responded, whether it's to climate change, humans coming over, um, sort of all of these sort of different events. Additionally, we can also get auction isotopes from herbivores at the site and also some of the carnivores. And these may give us some indication of what the climate was like as well, because the auction isotopes are sort of um, taking into consideration the, the sort of moisture sources or the water um, that these animals are consuming. As with so many of these deeply fascinating ancient animals, there remains the question of why don't we see them any longer? So why do we think that the Smilodon, as well as the other saber-toothed animals that you've mentioned, eventually went extinct? Um, we've actually been trying to study this for quite some time, and we've been able to actually rule out several hypotheses. So as I mentioned earlier, there was this hypothesis says that there was tough times and these animals were having to compete with humans for prey and were sort of scavenging carcasses right before they went extinct. Well, we don't see evidence of that, but it doesn't mean that humans or climate didn't necessarily contribute. Mm -hmm. um, it could have happened very quickly um, in which, or in a different mechanism where they just didn't have enough prey. We're really trying to tease these things apart. Um, and the only way to do that is to systematically sort of look at saber tooth cats through time and actually radiometrically date each of those specimens. And so as part of a large uh, National Science Foundation um, grant and six institutions and many, many collaborators, we are trying to sort of work out how animals responded to changes in climate and what their diet had, you know, how does their diet change? How has their morphology changed? And, you know, what was going on right before these animals went extinct? And we can do that by taking a specimen radiometrically dating it and getting a, a date um, that could tell us something about the age uh, when it lived. It can also tell us about, you know, sort of what the climate was like at that time because we have other records of climate that we can correlate that with. We can also get microscopic wear patterns from the teeth. We can also get the isotopes from the bone and the teeth, which can tell us different things. So putting this all together, we're really hoping to be able to evaluate you know, why these things went extinct. And, and part of the reason it's so hard to tease apart whether it was climate change or humans um, is because those things happen essentially at the same time. So you're having sort of a, a warming climate at the same time human populations are really increasing. 
And so what does that mean for this group of animals? Is, is it sort of a synergistic combination that's causing their extinction? Is it climate that's really the tipping point? And it's really important that we actually understand this because today we're living in a world in which we have both sort of large population growth and you know, uh, significant climate change. And those two things together are really wreaking havoc on, on living animals. Now, one thing we have done is we've actually kind of switched gears and studied a lot of the things that survive the megafaunal extinction. So because it's been really difficult to understand, you know, why did dire wolves or saber-toothed cats or these, you know, large animals go extinct, we've actually shifted gears to look at the things that survive. So the coyotes, the, the cougars, you know, what was their key to success? And we have learned a bit from that. Um, so in the case of the cougar, we found out that they were highly opportunistic when they lived and co-occurred uh, amongst saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and giant sharp-faced bears and all these other animals. And they were actually sort of the, the, the lower man on the totem pole, right? They were a smaller cat compared to everything else that was around, compared to the American lion, saber-toothed cats, et cetera. And then we, and, and what we find about um, cougars today is they're highly opportunistic. So they will actually fluctuate the types of prey they eat when they're found in the presence of wolves versus um, jaguars versus, you know, if they're in South America or in North America, they'll eat everything from armadillos to uh, deer and elk to vicuñas and guanacos. And so they will really kind of um, take advantage of different resources. And, and I always like to joke, I'd love to see a saber toothed cat hunt a rabbit right? Uh, not, not very effectively, um, but a cougar is going to have a better chance at, at being able to survive off of some of these smaller prey, which actually do successfully sort of make it through and, and survive this extinction event. So, you know, that's one aspect is that, you know, they were highly opportunistic. And we find out something very similar about coyotes is that today coyotes are highly opportunistic. And even though they weren't super opportunistic in the past, they became highly opportunistic when these things went extinct. Um, and so they were kind of also of that body size where they, they actually reduced their body size a bit. Um, and we think we're starting to eat smaller things. So there's this, this sort of inflection point where if you're above a certain body size, you eat things that are bigger than you if you're a carnivore. And if you're below a certain body size, you eat things that are smaller than you. And so coyotes have really sort of shifted to being sort of the smaller, um, being some of these smaller prey in many cases in which they're able to sort of survive quite well. And so we do know that the, the things that were able to eat small prey, um, things that were highly opportunistic, that those are the things that often survived. And so we're still working out why saber-toothed cats went extinct, but we do know that having elongated sabers, being bigger, these are all things that make you more specialized. And while being more specialized means that you're better able to do what you do, if things change and those prey are no longer available, you're going to have a really hard time. And so, you know, not to... Uh, sort of bring this all to reality, but this is kind of what we're seeing in polar bears. They're hyper-specialized, they're having a really hard time um, sort of changing their diet. They're not opportunistic like grizzly bears, for example. And I am really concerned that they're not gonna be able to adapt or change in response to climate change, much like the saber-toothed cat. And in the case of the polar bears, I think it's humans who are causing climate change. So it is both. <laughs> Absolutely. And in the case of polar bears, it's not that human populations are extremely high in any of the areas where polar bears are, right? It really is the indirect effects of humans causing climate change, which is causing reduction of sea ice, making it more difficult to hunt seals um, from the sea ice and really impacting these animals from afar, right? We're having global impacts you know, us, you know, living in, in Nashville or in the UK or wherever you may live are actually impacting polar bears indirectly um, via climate change. Well, I've wanted to tackle this subject for a long time now, and I'm very grateful indeed that you've been able to take a break from your research to talk about these amazing creatures. So uh, so what's next for you, Larissa? Uh, more work on saber tooths or something entirely different? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> so I like mammals broadly. So I will always continue to work on saber-toothed cats. Uh, they're absolutely fascinating creatures and we are actually continuing to study them, why they went extinct and also potentially some 
uh, sort of getting at some of the social behavior, perhaps. So I'll leave you with that little teaser. Oh. Um, but I'm also studying all sorts of other predators and also herbivores. I'm really interested in mammalian communities and especially how these mammalian communities have been responding to climate change. So um, a lot of my work is, is on predators, especially the Librea tar pits. But also another portion of my work is on animals from Australia. So we actually look at a lot of large animals that went extinct in Australia. And what I try to do is sort of recreate or reconstruct um, how these animals lived, what they were eating. And in the case of some of the really cool um, uh, carnivores we see there. So there was a, a it's a carnivorous animal. So it, it eats meat, but it's not part of carnivora. Um, but it is a marsupial, um, often referred to as a marsupial lion or thiacaleo. Um, another name oh, yes. that a <laughs> The one with the weird teeth, isn't it? Yes. The, yeah, it, it has great, very strange teeth and great big, great big teeth. Yes, yes, very strange teeth. And a colleague of mine often refers to them as killer wombats, which I think is a really great name. And it's it's because they actually evolved from an herbivorous group of wombats and yet became this sort of carnivorous group of animals. And so um, we are studying, you know, why did they go extinct? And and what can us- It looked like they used to crack nuts, didn't they? And like, you can imagine them cracking walnuts with those those middle teeth there. <laughs> or, or bone, <laughs> or, or animals. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, there's a lot of um, evidence that they may have actually been these ambush predators and hunted from the treetops. And so if you ever go to Australia, uh, the, uh, the Aussies like to tease the tourists and say, oh, yeah, we've got this thing called the drop bear, which is this thing that drops out of the trees and will, will eat you. Um, but in fact, there were essentially these, you know, real life uh, drop bears, not related to bears in any way, shape, or form, but these things that would hunt from the treetops and hunt other prey um, and, and did coexist and were around at the time um, that humans were on the landscape in Australia. So some really cool stuff there. And, and Australia is really kind of telling us a lot about what we might be facing in the future. So especially in regards to climate change, mm. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're hitting these sort of tipping points. So these tipping points are really important and can really give us an indication of some of the changes we've seen in the past and what we might anticipate moving forward. I will leave links to your website and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Larissa, for coming on to Evolution Soup. And hopefully we can have you back on the show again one day in the very near future. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I always like talking about saber-toothed cats. <laughs>